I'm Tony Oates, the Curator of Exhibitions here at the Drill Hall Gallery at the Australian National University. And I'm sitting in the exhibition Propeller today with the artist Ham Darick. Ham is a Canberra-based artist uh, who grew up in Sydney um, and moved to Canberra to study sculpture in the mid to late 1990s. Um, and you've travelled all over the world, Ham, but uh, it's interesting that you've come back to Canberra for this survey exhibition. You've been here a little while. Uh, and what we see in this exhibition is kind of a development from a predominantly sculptural practice into um, more recent interest into paintings and trying to translate a three-dimensional space onto a two-dimensional plane. Can you tell me a bit about your starting point at the ANU Sculpture School and how that influenced you and where it led and how you've uh, stepped across a divide of sorts, mm -hmm. if that's the right word. I, I um, was uh, at, the, at the sculpture department and uh, I'd come from Sydney, a TAFE course with some very formal sculptors, uh, Jan King and Paul Hopmeyer mm -hmm. and uh, Jim Croke, and I went down to here where there was a real sort of uh, mix between uh, a formal way of making art and a more investigative, uh, postmodern way of looking and making art. So when I arrived here in 1995, that was the vibe in the sculpture department. So there was performance work, uh, you know, lots of ephemeral work, clashing against really formal, you know, sculpture, you know, uh, carvings and um, welded steel. And so uh, I really enjoyed that discussion uh, back, in, back in the 90s and uh, it, it certainly uh, balanced my way of thinking about making art in some way. Uh, you, you, you could make it quite formal or you could attack that or you yeah. could go the reverse. The, the school at that point in time, the sculpture workshop was quite dynamic yeah. uh, and led by David Watt and you know he kind of was pushing it in multiple directions mm -hmm. which kind of opened a space where you could make any work that you wanted to and have yeah. it within the context of a, of a sculptural practice. Yeah. And develop your, your own, uh, hopefully to begin to develop your own voice within that. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, easy for some, not easy for others. And of course, you know, things change as, as far as modes of making go. But I found that uh, I was always interested in a pictorial depth and uh, relief carving was where I began that journey. Yep. And uh, historically, I was always interested in, you know, uh, investigating how you could use uh, objects to discuss that yep. uh, and that resonated through, through my work uh, from there. Uh, and this show, uh, I, I agree, looks at me pushing into a more pictorial space where I'm using tools to make mm. paintings rather than, um, sometimes they break free of that completely uh, and other times there's an echo back in to those tools. Yeah, yeah so, I mean, there's an interesting, uh, one of the kind of key uh, shifts in sculpture in the modern idiom was this idea of drawing in space and so artists were trying to use a uh, three-dimensional form to replicate the ideas of a drawing and I think what we see in your exhibition is the opposite or coming back out of sculpture into making uh, paintings so you're moving from a three-dimensional form into a two-dimensionality uh, which is quite surprising and the main way that you've been doing that is meditating on an object, but using colour as a spatial entity. And there's a whole series of paintings in this exhibition that meditate on a bowl form mm. uh, in which the colour uh, is so heavily charged with some oppositional forms or they're, they're mixed and set up against each other that we start to see an echo or a resonance expand outside of the, the colour. Can you talk about how you set up those dynamics using yeah. just colour and a negative space? Yes, yeah. so uh, one of the ways that I build a painting uh, and an image with uh, this present form that I'm working in is to set the colour against the white. Now that could be through uh, a, a small reference to a bowl. Uh, as, uh, as we're talking about the bowl series of paintings here, 
uh, I saw a tiny little bowl and um, the light hit the edge of that bowl and uh, its scale, in, in my mind, suddenly mm -hmm. enlarged. And it was because it, uh, that rim, that edge, activated and uh, created an unstable, kind of unsettling uh, uh, image that I could then work with. And then, of course, the colour is, is really uh, uh, quite robustly you know, uh, set against that. So uh, the bowl series for like Orbit uh, series was a, a strong uh, way of looking at an object, um, but also setting up a battle within the way you looked at the object. And that dynamism makes it interesting for me. Um, so uh, that leads into the wall paintings as well. Uh, the white is set against the color. Uh, there's usually uh, a color that's heavily manipulated, a blue that starts as a red. Uh, so you have a simultaneous uh, uh, agitation of color within that color itself. And then that's set against the red to make larger shapes. Um, yeah, there's yeah. like a known phenomenon of setting yeah. two colors against each other. And when you do so, two bold colors, you get uh, the complementary becoming present in the opposite color. But once you put a white gap between those two things, there's an exciting energy that is like uh, reflected between the gap and it kind of ignites. The and I feel that as a physical thing, you know, uh, so, uh, you know, the object has a resonance in itself. And then uh, I feel that I, if I can push that into uh, a painting and set those colours against the white, that it, it, it really creates a deeper pictorial depth than, than most paintings, uh, you know, uh, that are, are dealing with a fully painted uh, no white, yep. and then working back with a little bit of white later, maybe to highlight something. Yep. I put the white in first, yep. and then you know work towards. It. I think there's some classic examples of the the Mantis works and Wink are kind of the the key uh, proponents of that model. In those works, you're sort of thinking of the saw form, but then using a white to separate two colours. Yeah. There's a great dynamic that occurs in Wink where the saw blades close in on one another, whereas in the Mantis works they seem to open up and expand yeah. in space. The two, two new works are Mantis, they're just from last year, is that correct? Yes, that's right, they're, yeah. they're new works last year. And uh, unlike Wink, uh, Wink has its own sort of uh, optical movement that I really pushed, uh, and I did that in two ways. The first way was to uh, separate the blades and use the angles. Mm -hmm. But the second way was to remix the colour again differently. So one side of the painting is quite heavily, uh, you know, painted with mm -hmm. a sort of dark red and a dark golden yellow. And then rather than just saying, I'm going to add white, I mix those colours again with another colour in it. So suddenly your eye does pick up on those things yeah. and uh, it becomes uh, activated in two ways. Uh, the, late, the later paintings, Mantis 1 and 2, that are in this show, the colours, what I've tried to do there is make the colours bounce out mm. into the white space. So you see an echo, a flashing. Yep. Bra. So the movement is a flash rather than a visual Fair optical. Enough. And it makes another colour. For me, yep. I see, you know, a, like a, a pinky colour and a, 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 also a sort of another lighter yellow. That's but yeah. yeah, so it's still using the white, but slightly differently yeah and you know that all of those paintings and all the paintings in the show in fact they reference an object that might have once been a sculpture in some way so I always see those uh, those wink and mantis referring to the saw and knowing that you've got saws and tools yeah. you know they give you access to make a painting those objects and I guess with the wall painting that's sitting behind us counter-attack the tool that you have chosen that in other instances you've used to make an artwork of and present it as a physical artwork, the tool is extended across a two-dimensional plane and acts in a totally different way. Yeah. Can you talk about the process of how you use a tool, a cubit, on the wall painting and, yeah. and what, how that limits your actions but how it enhances your action as well? Yeah, uh, it's... Um... It's set up a, a really, uh, it, it's a pictorial challenge in a way, uh, because these wall paintings initially come from 
me making a painting on an object. Uh, my grandfather's box ruler, which folds out, and I put a geometric pattern, very carefully painted a geometric pattern of triangles on that ruler. And then I thought one day, what if I use this ruler to make a painting yep. now that I've altered it? And so I treated it as a beam compass of sorts, you know, and held one end and traced the other end, and then uh, kept what I thought would be uh, a simple way to do it, to one colour, even though that colour was manipulated. Yep. Uh, it was a, a blue that had red in it, and then just gradients. So uh, that object, um, you know, triggered that way of making what paintings directly on the wall for me. Um, and it was integral, you know, but it was a really exciting jump. You know? Yeah, it's quite an interest. It's not the way a painter might approach making a painter, if, the, if you might, don't mind me saying so, no. because uh, it's still tied to a physical object that's found. And I think that's quite, that's quite an interesting trajectory that we see in the work, is that yeah. the object becomes a mechanism to open up to yes. become something that it's not and become a painting. And uh, what's very interesting about the, this painting is that you're also referencing uh, a series of um, Renaissance paintings. Can yes. you talk about the relationship and where that uh, comes from? So, of course, the counterattack is, um, uh, there's a scaffolding in counterattack. Uh, to make a painting this big, uh, I really wanted to have a discussion, uh, have some deeper thinking about uh, a way of making painting mm -hmm. and the Renaissance is a good way to start because you're talking about pictorial depth and that huge jump that they made uh, considering space. But I didn't literally want to paint that so I thought if I used uh, that method which has now become a cubit which is from the tip of my finger to the tip of my elbow uh, that fan shape in there uh, is drawn from that uh, and so they come from three uh, triptych called the Battle of San Romano, uh, which is uh, Paolo Uccello, and one's in the National Gallery London, uh, which I've seen quite a bit from having lived and worked in London a bit. And uh, the other two are in the Uffizi and the Louvre. Uh, I've also had a look. They're much changed paintings um, colour-wise. They were very silver. Uh, but what hasn't changed in them is the joyous kind of investigation of objects and spaces. And uh, I thought that why not use my proportions now to explore that in a painterly way? Uh, so, you know, I scaled them to my scale, you know, so up from there. So if I had two arms re reaches, that was, uh, you know, four cubits. Yep. So uh, I then began to investigate the space and discovered uh, more about this way of making painting in the process. It's ephemeral, of course, it's going to get painted over. So. Yeah, I think that, that, that's quite an interesting uh, concept because in many of the sculptural works, you're kind of rescuing an object from impending doom, pulling things out of the Thames or pulling out basketball uh, uh, nets from, uh, you know, the impending death. Yeah. But here, you're making a work that uh, will be erased very soon. And there's, a, there's an interesting contrast between its impermanence and the, sol the solidity of those, uh, those sculptural forms. Mm. The time that you made this work, it took about five and a half, six weeks to yeah. complete. Um, we were in some sort of environmental crisis. Um, do you just put that out of your head when you're making it or are you... I really found it difficult to, to put it out of my head. Um, it, it was a, the most uh, challenging work to make. Uh, because, you know, as an artist, often you are, you know, close to your emotions. You may not display that, and not all artists are that way, but um, I, I found that really challenging because I was investigating a very human thought, yep. making a painting, a very historical way of uh, re recalling something and uh, adding a history to, to something. Mm. And also I knew it was ephemeral, so uh, I had to begin to make a structure that I could enjoy and inhabit. And um, I found ways to do that in this painting. Uh, so what did you learn about Ocello's painting in painting it that you might not have already understood? Is there something that came out yeah, of that process? I, mean, I think he was um, very interested in uh, signals within his painting. Uh, you know, constructing a, a fallen lance or a series of lances to, to uh, and really looking at the object. Um, but 
also within that, he was very creative in his um, structuring of geometric shapes uh, that broke free of that. They, like there's flags in those paintings that you could just take the flag and have a look at that uh, geometric pattern that he's made and it would be just as interesting. Yeah. Um, so I, I, and he's used as a very literal uh, example uh, of learning how to make uh, a signal in a painting, in a composition. But I think spatially, he created all these really large rhomboids, large triangles in his work that go across the three paintings. And suddenly, um, they haven't been exhibited in a row. In fact, uh, I think he was, from Vasari, desirous to only show them on three different walls. Mm -hmm. But I put them in a row and made connections across that. Yeah. And um, the other thing I really found fascinating about uh, using his uh, drawing, his, his compositional drawings, was pushing things uh, like the lances, uh, long lines and repetitive long lines. And I wanted to push the color behind some of those. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm stuck on the same plane. So I had these kind of uh, pictorial dilemmas to solve within it. And that was really challenging. Uh, but in places, I think it was really rewarding. It's quite interesting how pronounced those rhomboids actually become in your abstraction of that painting. So uh, the way that they project out, and you know, you're making shapes with color, yeah. but then you're really making shapes with the negative space at the same time. And um, you know, we've talked a bit about the sonic quality yeah. of, of space uh, and the echoes that occur in this construction. Um, we see greens, blues, greys, pinks shifting across and bouncing off each other, yeah. but we also see those negative forms, the rhomboids and the triangles projecting towards us. So uh, in terms of a spatial kind of conceit, mm. uh, how do you use negative space to develop those things? Well, I think it's quite evident in, uh, uh, we just saw the time lapse of me making it the yeah. other day. And uh, you know, that's on, you can see that on the uh, drill hall site. Uh, it's like a seesaw. Yeah. Um, I kind of hang something in the middle and then I go either side uh, and I keep doing that. And that's me uh, drawing it with, a, with kind of uh, the color and then drawing it with the absence of color and I'm balancing that as I go all the way. Uh, but I found that, that uh, there's a certain period of time when there's enough paint on the wall where both have to work together. Yeah. Uh, and, and hopefully the viewer can find those, those spaces and enjoy that aspect. Well, there's another work that you've made specifically for this show, I See Red, which is in the gallery too. Um, that is a premise that we've talked around a bit, I guess, today. Uh, again, coming out of Goethe's experiences of colour. Yep. Uh, can you talk about how that has evolved into something much bigger than a, a gouache on a piece of paper yeah. and how you kind of consider making something for a room? Yeah, that was uh, a series of gouaches that I made and started, you know, uh, really in 2011. There's a blue uh, and green gouache in Gallery 3 it's quite, it's called Night's Edge. And uh, the, the dark color looks, initially it looks black, but the closer you get, it's green. And uh, I was really interested in Goethe's color studies and his um, surrounding color with the dark or creating a gap with the light, which is what he does a, a lot to, to find out which colors lean towards each other from the color spectrum, you know. So you've got your blues at one end and you've got your reds at the other. And uh, you have, uh, a volume of both to work with in, in IC Red Room. Um, and both of those colours though start as red. So the, I then bulk up the colour until it becomes a dark green or a, a dark, or a blue. And they both have their weights and there's a discussion between the weights there with, with that. Uh, and that's, that work's become more and more sort of uh, dynamic in, in that I've found that within that process there's other references for me uh, that I've been sort of processing and, and working towards making yep. for years. Uh, you know, and some of them are as simple as, you know, looking at a Sidney Nolan, uh, there's a painting that, that's called um, Quilting the, the Armour, where the blue void of the sky is being stitched inside the helmet, you know. 
and it's like a reflection. It's a reflection, so yeah, yeah. And so in in um, in I see red, that blue is spatial as well, mm. more so initially than the the dark green, but then the dark green sort of creeps up on you because within it you do pick up a harmony of red. I'm sure, you know. I guess uh, you bring up an interesting point. Like uh, a lot of your work. Uh, is historically engaged with artists that you're interested in or artists who've made great leaps forward. I mean, I see like the Delaunay's quite regularly in some yeah. of your works. Yeah. Uh, there's obviously like um, the Tatlons as well. We talked about them yeah. before. But uh, Matisse, I see in several things. But you're, you're very engaged with the past and you're a keen observer. Um, you get to travel quite a bit to see things, so you're quite fortunate in that regard. But um, that engagement with the, the past obviously feeds into a lot of your, your work currently. Yeah, it's, inc it's certainly inquiry, and it, it, it um, sometimes percolates up in ways that I don't expect it to. I mean, I see Frank Stella in yeah. a lot of in, in these more recent Mantis things. There's a lot of like uh, reference to his action or to you know the opening up and the, the yeah. systems of yeah. making a painting. Yeah, and I mean they're they're all. Um, I suppose it's two things. It's my kind of memory uh, and the way I use my knowledge of of uh, a painting or a series of works that I've enjoyed, and then my actual ability to physically make something yeah. just with a you know simple tool. So yeah. uh, paintbrush and paint. Uh, you know, uh, all of these works are just hand painted. Uh, you know, I'm very much about that. Yeah, no, there's certainly, you can certainly, the tactility of the hand in a lot of these works is what activates them as yeah. well. Like, uh, so in a photograph, they may appear crisp and clean, and there is an element of that, yeah. but there's a lot of nuance to the surface, uh, particularly in these bowl paintings, yeah. where um, the, the colour isn't applied with um, exact precision, it's, it's all there. And it, the nuance of the hand actually helps to activate the surface. The lines aren't perfectly straight, the circles aren't exact, no. but you know, the body. The human body. It's interesting you say Frank, Frank Stella in that way, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Uh, he's so integral into like getting the big brush and painting oh, those black exactly. and whites. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, if it's 1 20th out, it's better, That's you know, right. yeah. than something, because it, you, your, your eye picks that up and you engage with it, I think it creates a nicer distance That's true. Yeah. to look at something. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, I'm very lucky as, uh, also, I have travelled a lot and seen a lot of art, mm. uh, you know, and worked for, you know, very well-known artist mm. uh, for some time now. Um, and no doubt that stuff uh, rubs off on you, but um, you, in a way it's been good for me to go the other way mm. rather than have become a a painter's painter straight away, yeah. you know. Uh, I've been able to free myself of a lot of uh, pressure, I think, yeah. by thinking about objects and and uh, and space and time, yeah. because uh, underpinning, you know, this work it's ephemeral. The other works are on the edge of being lost completely. Mm -hmm. uh, the shovel heads have been pulled out of the Thames; they're half falling to bits, uh, and I've given them a new life and, and a new discussion. Uh, so. Well, certainly, that's, that goes both ways, that historical knowledge, I think, you know. I'm yeah. willing to let some of it go, and I'm willing to, you know, take on. Yeah, so there is quite a lot of knowledge. Like, uh, we've got the work Moon Boy in the back gallery there as well. You obviously had a bit of a thing with Nolan, well, an ongoing kind yeah. of relationship with his works. Yeah. Um, that, that work in particular kind of speaks uh, quite strongly of, uh, like, this sort of dynamic between abstraction and the figurative, and you've kind of captured uh, both the human head and an idea of abstraction or the, the setting sun yeah. at the same time. Yeah, that certainly Nolan um, was an influence. Um, when I lived in London, uh, I was thinking about some paintings and, uh, of his, and when I came back, uh, a, lot of, a lot of that came out. Mm -hmm. But it was more also about thinking about uh, an icon uh, and not necessarily having him as an icon, mm. but saying, what are you actually doing in your paintings that's making you this kind of uh, thing? Is it the colour? And then, you know, uh, humour's important in my work too, yeah, you know? So, um, <laughs> you know, he, uh, you know, he's quite, people know Nolan and they can be quite serious about him, mm. but I, I kind of like that looseness. Not to say that he's always serious, because yeah. I don't think he was, but Moonboy, you know, 
as soon as I saw that shovel head, it was the, a referencing that painting, you know. It, maybe it was just so uh, much of an extension to the figure. It's got a neck, mm -hmm. it's got its head, and I just put the disc in the middle. So it was kind of a, a little jab, but it was also a, a, a nod as well, <laughs> you know, can do both. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and Sun Trap uh, with the rabbit traps. The first work I made of rabbit traps references, a not, it's called Diversion, yeah. uh, you've seen yeah. it. Uh, uh, that references um, his painting uh, called Hair in a Trap. Right. And uh, there's a rabbit in the, it's in the Arco in New South Wales, there's a rabbit trapped in a rabbit trap with its foot, but its eyes are blue and they're his father's eyes. Mm. So, you know, you, people not initially get that, uh, but then, you know, you'll find your way into a painting. Mm. And uh, so that work, Diversion, had red and blue on the plates of the traps. So they were kind of almost kinetic yep. uh, with, a, with a geometric movement backwards and forwards, but they were prized open as yep. well. So they had a bit of bite, you know, visually. <laughs> well, sun, sun Trap's kind of very similar in terms that uh, the colour uh, both activates the, the trap, but also makes you forget that the yeah. trap is, a, is another object. Yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a reversal of, of, its, uh, of its purpose, or its purpose still stays with us, yeah. but um, you recontextualise that, and that's, that comes through in all the sculptures, really. Yeah, uh, and importantly that um, Sun Trap uh, became a, a, a sphere and a, a body itself. Yep. Uh, so the walls painted, it's integral to have that wall behind it, a deep uh, indigo blue, and it allows it to just activate the yellow yep. that's underneath it. So there's this dynamism that's happening with the colours as well, mm -hmm. uh, as the brutality of the, um, uh, of the traps being turned into something less brutal, you know, a pictorial discussion, a discussion about, you know, uh, planetary bodies or something like a void as well. Well that work reminds me a bit of Howard Taylor and I know you've been fascinated with his work as yeah. well uh, and you actually have a couple of small Howard yeah. Taylors at your house yeah. that fascinatingly resemble uh, <laughs> a table tennis. They do yeah Bat, which is really like curious yeah. uh, uh, and I didn't have them when I started painting on table okay. tennis bats yeah, yeah, yeah. which is curious. Uh, the first series of bats was 2001 mm -hmm. uh, and they were portraits yep. and it was called uh, great white blokes and carved into those bats were you know the great white blokes of Australia at the, at the time a very a very political series of work called rally you know so we had you know Kerry Packer uh, uh, you know John Howard lots of politicians Alan Jones you know and it was a direct pun on the rally of life mm -hmm. and then I thought well uh, these I left them for a little while, uh, a year or two, and then I went back and started painting on them and carving into them. So, uh, and then I, when, I, when the Howard Taylors uh, arrived, <laughs> they were um, so personal, you know. They were this size, the same as a bat. They weren't, uh, and they're marquettes for sculptures yep. that he made that were much bigger. So we're talking about scale straight away, you know. So I've, I felt completely, you know, uh, positive about you know, the way I was working. Mm -hmm. Certainly, um, as an artist, that's a good thing. It doesn't happen all the time. But, you know, if I'm painting on a table tennis bat, it could be a bit of a, uh, a pun or a loose thing. But actually, you know what, it's, it's, it's a, a vehicle to allow people to look at your work that may not. It's, uh, but it's certainly an entry, like it's even for yourself, it's an entry or it's a bridge between uh, the sculptural form yeah. and the paintings and like the flatness of the surface of the uh, of the bats kind of stands in for the flatness of the canvas um, and you're allowed to then uh, develop space within both of them. And they're mementos as well in yeah. a way. Uh, La Dance, which is after Matisse, uh, even though it doesn't have the figures directly in it, it's reduced to a geometric shape. Uh, Anyone who knows the Matisse work, they pick it up straight away. So yeah. like it's, it's, it's evident straight away without the figures. It's quite... The colour helps. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and it's such an amazing painting, yeah. uh, you know, and I've, I remember seeing it the first time and, you know, uh, feeling really small and learning a lot from it, you know. So it's... Um, but those bats were, you know, out in the flea market in Paris, you know, and uh, they had to be an echo of, of their of what I'd just seen. So that's often a way I work. So that, that little moment of engagement with an object can be 
more greatly uh, investigated.